There's one right there. Welcome, everyone. Thank you guys for being here today. Um, it's a very special day for Cape Canaveral. It's uh, not only a, a celebration of us getting the Irma Canoe back to Brevard, which is a very special bit of our local history, but it's also the first tangible little bit of the Cape Center coming to fruition. Um, that's kind of how it made its way to Cape Canaveral, was uh, people in Tallahassee knew that Cape Canaveral was developing the Cape Center and we were getting ready to put together a, a, a nice culture and arts center and that helped them decide to choose us for the home of the Irma Canoe. So I'm not going to take up a bunch of time. Today we have uh, Mr. Randy Lathrop who actually found the canoe and we definitely want to thank him because he saved it from the bulldozers picking it up with the rest of the Irma debris along River Road. So we'll start with him, and then we have two archaeologists that have worked very closely with the canoe and its conservation from Paleo West Archaeology Group. So we'll start with Randy. Thanks, everybody, for coming out today. This is a nice, casual group here. I hope they We'll be able to talk. Matt, it's nice to see you. Terry Armstrong, all oh, a bunch of folks here. It's nice to see. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking uh, the city of Cape Canaveral for this opportunity to speak today. Uh, thank you and congratulations on securing this, this mysterious one-of-a-kind artifact for display. Um, the canoe will be quite happy here, uh, close to the salt air and just miles from where it was hidden for many years. News alert, there is no news. Uh, the canoe is still a mystery. Many people might be disappointed that a, solid, that a solid date and origin is not available at this time, but it just goes to show, as many say, uh, archaeology is not an exact science. That's for you, Julie. Um, and I think it's still being a mystery allows us all sorts of scenarios, which uh, I think is quite exciting. Let us, uh, let's imagine for a moment some of the possibilities. Um, history tells us that there was much going on in this area of Florida between the carbon dates of the canoe, which would be 1690s to late 1800s. Uh, since most agree the dugout was made by peoples of European descent, could the canoe have been connected to any of the following historic Florida milestones? And I'm going to go over a few. Um, we'll review some now. So to begin, we're going to start with the 1600s, late 1600s. In 1696, Quaker Jonathan Dickinson shipwrecks near Jupiter is taken hostage by the natives and makes his way to St. Augustine. His memories are keen, and he writes one of the most impressive and compelling accounts of this area. He writes the following regarding possible use of sails on canoes. He writes, about this time, we saw a sail to the eastward, and we, supposing it at first to be a brigantine, agreed to follow her. But in small time, we made it to be a canoe or boat with two masts and sails. She stood in for shore, but as soon as they saw us, she bore away. And when she saw we made not after her, she stood ashore again for the Indian town. He goes on to speak how the natives would lash two canoes together. Quote, we all drew down to the waterside to receive the chief. We perceived he came in state, having two canoes lashed together with poles from one to the other making a platform which covered with a mat. Then we're up to the 1700s. Of course, the first thing that comes to mind is the, uh, the Spanish plate fleet is caught in a hurricane in 1715. 11 ships are lost, over 1,000 lives. Our beach is littered with gold, silver, and bodies. Survivors walk the beaches just mere blocks from here on their way north. Many of us are still picking up litter from that one, Terry. Anyway, also at this time, uh, terrifying slave raids were made by British colonists and Creek Indians in 1711. They made their way through this area, capturing and kidnapping as they went instilling hatred among the natives with their brutality. During these years, Florida traded hands several times, Spanish, then British, then Spanish again. Andrew Turnbull's failed colony, New Smyrna, is just up the road in Volusia County. In 1768, he organized the largest attempt at British colonization in the New World by founding New Smyrna. It, nearly, it was nearly three times 
the size of the Jamestown colony. By 1777, it had failed and all inhabitants had fled to St. Augustine. We're up to the 1800s now. We had three Seminole Indian Wars from 1816 to 1858. Fort Anne, built in 1837, is just up the road in Merritt Island. It served as a depot for General Jessup's military offensive against the Seminoles. The Hernandez Trail, which started out as an old Indian trail, cut in 1837 to march south four columns of 9,000 men, is most likely only a few miles west from where the canoe was found. We're into the Civil War period. In Northern Brevard, there remains to this day salt works from the Civil War where rebels boiled down seawater for much prized salt. The pioneer settlement of City Point, very near where the canoe was found, was first settled in 1860, then shortly after by Civil War Confederate veterans who started groves and, finished and fished in the area. We suspect this canoe might have seen more than one life. Could the canoe, in some fashion, be associated with any of these events? Not saying it was. But anything is possible. The mystery continues. <clears throat> I had five minutes. I'm trying to stay with it. Um, let me go on to say I'm proud to be a Floridian, and I love the story of the state, especially our area here in Indian River, Cape Canaveral, and Brevard. Uh, I've been blessed to interact with many parts of the wonderful history here, from Spanish galleons wrecked upon our shores to photographing the efforts by man to reach for the stars from Cape Canaveral. That the dugout was an accidental discovery should come as no surprise, really. Much of the historic finds here in Florida are accidental. It's made by the public, not archaeologists. Just to mention a few, the longest dugout in Florida history, the trader's canoe, was 50 feet long. It was found by two bass fishermen near a boat ramp. And actually, they have a picture of that in the, uh, in the artifacts room. You'll be able to see a photo of that. Um, just this past year, uh, they recently found an incredible 7,000-year burial mound off Venice. It was found by a sport diver. Um, in West Florida, the location and the landing site of the doomed 1559 expedition led by Tristan de Luna, which had escaped the experts for centuries, was found accidentally by a history buff who was paying attention to pottery shards in a vacant lot. The largest gold object ever found on a Spanish galleon in Florida waters was found by three young men diving off the coast near Vero Beach in 12 feet of water in 1977. A magnificent gold tray weighing over a pound, easily worth a half million dollars. The boys notified the state in an attempt to do the right thing. <clears throat> I know because I was one of those three young men. Uh, incidentally, that find led me to a 20-year career in historical shipwreck salvage. As the saying goes, I know a thing or two because I've seen a thing or two. At this time, uh, I'd like to take a minute. I want to thank Craig Mest. Uh, Craig, please stand up for just a minute, if you would. But Craig's my good friend who was instrumental in providing the heavy equipment, the security, the archaeological immersion pond that we put the canoe in, <laughs> and the logistics to rescue the dugout canoe. Uh, trust me, the front end loaders were, were less than a mile down the road that day. Uh, we were literally minutes from losing this artifact to the landfill. Uh, I was so excited I threw my back out. I, I, I paid for it for a couple weeks, trust me. Uh, <laughs> anyway, Craig and I were many years, we were both commercial divers working together on various projects. Uh, ironically, while filming Shipwrecks and Belize in 1984, we used a dugout canoe uh, for much of our transportation. Uh, thankfully, it did have an outboard motor on it at that time, and, and trust me, they worked very well with outboard motors on them. I'm not sure this one would, but uh, bottom line, if not for Craig, we wouldn't be here today. He has um, quietly remained in the background, supporting every effort to save this artifact. Thank you, Craig. Um, <clears throat> I have also enjoyed working with Julie Duggins. Julie has a passion for canoes. She has a great combination of head and heart. The dugout was fortunate to have her for an advocate. Thanks, Julie. Um, in closing, it's a fact that the majority of Florida sites have been found by non-professional archaeologists and then reported to the state. Government archaeologists rarely have the funding these days to accomplish much digging, which means strictly under their control, much of the past has the potential to be lost to natural processes. 
The truth of the matter is the archeological community has an army of well-equipped citizens with a love for history who would love nothing more than to help them. You don't need to belong to a society or a network to love history and no degree is required. Many experts in the field start as amateurs but become experts. Professional and non-professional should be trying to find common ground as most of us want the same thing. Yes, it belongs to the people of Florida, but we are the people of Florida. History's enemies are not the general public, it's not the collectors, it's not the hobbyist arrowhead collectors, the fossil hunters, the treasure hunters, or the metal detectors which threaten our history. It's development, it's the bulldozers, it's progress, it's mother nature, it's storms, it's time, and it's sometimes it's the lack of action that will erode our historic sites and cancel them out for all time. But this time, we all win. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. I have maybe a, a couple minutes for questions, if anybody has a question. Please. Well, and um, Julie will get into this probably in her talk, but the, the, uh, the, the expert on, on native canoes, a seminal expert on him, took one look at the canoe and said, no, no way. This is not native made. This is European made. But you know, there was so much going on in this coast. I mean, uh, you know, I would refer everybody to read Jonathan Dickinson's journal and uh, I want to acknowledge Terry Armstrong here in the audience too. He's a publisher. He writes wonderful books on this area. A uh, Hundred Giants, West of the Bull, The Rainbow Chasers. If you get a chance, please check out his books. It's all on this area and it's all local history and it's all first and second hand accounts. It's great stuff. Um, but no, we're pretty sure that it's of European descent. As sure as people can be. Anybody else? Julie. I thought this is crazy. <laughs> People said, well, how did you recognize it? I was like, well, like I said, when Craig and I were in Belize 20, 30 years ago, they still used dugouts down there. And I mean, anybody that's hopefully been to a museum once or twice has encountered a dugout canoe. But I immediately thought, I said, I thought, this is crazy. And the way it was, it was just sitting in the road. And I've had to say that over and over and over again because they've been like, well, you drug it up out of there, didn't you? And you place this. No, I didn't, trust me. I was more concerned with my bike was squeaking and creaking and stuff because of the salt water. Trust me, bikes hate salt water. Um, but I was just amazed that it was there. And that's when I immediately texted it. I took a picture of it and I texted it to my good friend, Jim Sinclair, who is, a, uh, who is on Cooper's Treasure. You can see Jim, he's on Cooper's Treasure. He's a staff member on Cooper's Treasure now. But, I texted it to him, and his response was WTF. And that was basically my response, too. You know, and so we were kind of at a standstill there, you know. Yes, ma'am. Do you think uh, over time that it passed through different hands and was modified and, and you know, did something valuable like they spend a lot of time with it? Yes. 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 Absolutely. I do now. I'm not a professional, but I have an opinion just like anybody else. But there's no reason why this wasn't repurposed over and over and over again. We didn't become a throwaway society probably until the past 50 years or something like that. So we, we never threw anything away like that. And there's absolutely no reason why that couldn't have been repurposed over and over and over again. I would, if I found it, I'd say, wow, this is cool. And guess what? It still floats. Let's go, you know, but uh, with the nails, um, the, the carbon dating, because there's a couple variety of nails, absolutely. You know, and at one time I thought, um, anybody who's been to a hunting lodge at any time up north or whatever, I mean, you'll see in the hunting lodges, they have all these great antiquities hanging on the wall many times, you know. So I was like, wow, who knows, you know. Maybe some guy found this back in the 1800s, had a lodge here, and maybe it was hanging on its wall. I mean, the possibilities are endless. Nobody knows for sure. And that's, that's what's cool about it. So you're right, I'm right, she's right, he's right, we're all right, you know. Anybody else? Yes? The red cypress, it's made of red cypress. No, it's actually red cedar. Red cedar? 
Yeah, and that's the only red cedar canoe uh, in Florida's collection right now, so to speak. It's the only one that's been found. Do you guys happen to know where that originates from, likely, or no? Yep. Well, it, it's a, it, frankly, where the canoe was found, there's just two of the most magnificent, beautiful red cedar trees standing right there. And, and sadly, it took a couple of trips before we were standing there and going, hey, <laughs> look at that. That's a red cedar tree. And they're not really that common. I mean, this, this, this line here, this latitude, is pretty much a demarcation for red cedar. Um, I mean, they're, they're popular up north and the northwest and stuff like that, but not Florida red cedar. Uh, they're very specific about this kind of red cedar. Yeah. Anybody else? Please. Sure. This was found on the west bank of the Indian River in the City Point area. So I will say it was found north of City Point Road along the Indian River. Um, so it came out of the Indian River there, very close to City Point. Very close to City Point. Uh, we were somewhat reluctant to, to narrow it down too much, but good luck. <laughs> you know. Anybody else? Well, once again, thank you up for all your time. And, um, you know, if anybody has questions, feel free to shoot me an email or something. Thanks again, Molly. Thank you so much. Thanks, Julie. <laughs>
Who saw it from the Facebook post before it hit the news? Yeah. I think I did too. In fact, I think that's where most people saw it. And in fact, I think that's where, uh, that's where it really got legs. And, and we can thank you for that. And we can thank social media for making it completely viral. And people's interests and intrigue and, and finding something good coming from this, this storm that was uh, you know, not, not exactly the best of situations. Slide, Mom. <clears throat> so the canoe washes ashore. Randy posts it on Facebook, and all of a sudden uh, we've got we've got media stories, right? And and the the first thing that Randy did was he contacted the state. He put it into the hands of you know the people who who share and interpret this collective history, which is fantastic. And the questions started coming, and exactly like he alluded to, you know, a lot of times people bring artifacts or or sites to the people who work centrally in the state. And at the time, Steve and I both worked for the Division of Historical Resources. We worked at the state. That's how we got involved in this at all. We've just recently, between a year ago when it was found and now, split off. And, uh, and we're now working for a consulting firm. But a lot of times, people bring these artifacts to the state, members of the public, or bring them to archaeologists, professional archaeologists, and ask some, some basic questions. The first one being, what is it? Well, how old is it? All the same things that you alluded to. What does it do? How is it used? Um, and we can rely on, and this is really important, uh, and this is the perspective, I think, that professional archaeologists can bring to help, to help you interpret your history, uh, is, is that we can bring a wealth of data on canoes that have already been found. So here in Florida, we have, to date, the, we have 423 canoes that have been found and documented. That was the 422nd. Um, and, and it's been a long history of canoe making and also canoe research. Canoe making started almost 7,000 years ago. Canoe research started really in earnest in the 80s, but a little bit before that in the 50s, people were dabbling. And we now know that we've got this, we've got the largest canoe site in the world in, in Alachua County at Noonan's Lake. We've got the largest concentration of canoes in the world here in Florida. We've got the oldest canoe in the Western Hemisphere. And what's really, really great is we have all this information about the canoes. Uh, loads and loads of cells in a table and a database, right? Uh, but also files, really rich files, photographs from people who have found them, and maybe even the canoe disintegrated before it was recorded, uh, measurements and information. And that's what we want to uh, present to you here today is uh, the pieces of information and how they, they fit together to form one story of this particular dugout behind the backdrop of that, that context. Yeah, so uh, as Julie was saying, we're, we're really interested in understanding uh, the bigger picture of the canoe. And oftentimes we have these canoes that are reported to us almost all uh, through uh, members of the public that would contact the government uh, to report these hundreds of canoes. And we compile information. This one is unique in the quantity of information that we've compiled from it, um, largely in part because it was so uh, captured the public's uh, imagination. And we were able to organize um, a, a public session in Tallahassee on it. And a lot of different researchers from University of Tennessee, University of Georgia, and elsewhere came together and helped us work on this canoe. So these were all, the way we like to think of it is kind of pieces of the puzzle. And a lot of times when you're doing archaeology, uh, you kind of you want to try and put together a picture, but you're missing most of the pieces of the puzzle, and you don't really have the box, so you don't know what the picture looked like either. So you're kind of you've got these little disparate pieces that are floating around. Some fit together nicely, some not so nicely, and you kind of have to try and put a piece of the puzzle, put them all in one order, and kind of come up with a picture. And so because this particular canoe is so well studied, we have more pieces of that puzzle than of the 400 or so other canoes that have been studied so far. So what we're going to go through today are some of the pieces of the puzzle, and then we're going to try and arrange them a little bit. And, um, and hopefully, a, a kind of a picture will emerge from those pieces. So if you don't, next slide. OK, so we've asked three really basic research questions that are going to kind of frame our discussion of how we think about these puzzle pieces. These questions are, how old is it? How is it made? And really basically, what is it? 
Uh, and, and we're going to try and address each of these questions um, at length with a little bit of scientific analysis to, so that you can appreciate how much work has gone into this. And then we'll present the results of the different analyses and, and kind of talk about how people have viewed them, how we view them. Uh, we've already heard how Randy views them. And, and so it'll kind of get a, a, a picture that will come together from these pieces. So the first question is, how old is it? And I know that's a question that's on your minds, right? If you Google, if you Google Irma Canoe, uh, the first, I don't know, 10 or so hits will be news articles. And what is the, the, the title of those new, news articles? Hey, it's all about the date, right? That's the, that's the question that people wanted to hear. And I think Randy can probably reflect on that because he talked to a lot of reporters. Probably, you probably talked to more than anyone in this case since you found it, right? Um, and, and what was the number one question they asked you? How old is it? How old is it? And they always refer to it as ancient. It's just, it's, it's just absolutely the wrong word. You know, but yeah, we're all concerned how old. So we'll start, okay. We'll start with that word ancient. Um, and maybe soften it a little and use maybe the word historic, right? And all we mean by that, I think, is not modern. <laughs> I'm sure somebody asked at one point, is this a hoax? This is a joke. Did somebody make this and put it on the side of the road? Well, we can tell you conclusively, no, it's not. Um, and there's, there's evidence on the dugout itself that tells us it's not. Uh, and the first, the first very basic thing that you can all see with your eyes plain and clear is you know what freshly worked wood looks like, right? Uh, it looks like the, the slide at the very top where the guys are, are actually carving out a canoe. And you know what weathered wood looks like. And you know what worked wood that has been weathered looks like, right? Which looks a little bit more like the picture on the upper right that you can see. And that's a picture of, you know, a close-up picture of the dugout. The one in the foreground here is not only a picture of uh, the weathered wood, but it's also a picture of differentially weathered wood, right? So we've got two different colors, just at, at a very basic level, it is old. It's not, it's not modern. And if you want to use the word ancient, that's fine. But it's historic. <laughs> it's historic. And ancient historic, we should say, starts at 50 years when we're talking about historical resources and sites. Um, so no offense if, if you're older, older than 50. We don't mean it that way at all. Um, another thing that you can tell in this picture, and Randy alluded to it, is that the canoe was used over time, right? And perhaps uh, modified. And we have two different weathering patterns. So it appears that you know either something was attached here, or with the case with the splinter above the little blue paint, um, you know it's possible that that this was modified over time and used in different ways. We have a couple more, probably one more slide. We have a couple more lines of, of evidence that are physical on the canoe that we can get to. But the first, the first thing that we, we thought when we were looking at, uh, when we were looking to answer the question of how old is the canoe, the first thing we wanted to do was uh, run a radiocarbon date, and that's the, the, you know, first go-to approach for, for answering that question. We're at the... Next slide. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. We're stuck. We'll talk about this. We can talk about the nails momentarily. Yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, on this picture, you can clearly see, um, as Julie was talking about, the, the weathering of the wood. And here you can see that this wood was clearly weathered. This is part of the canoe that we're seeing a close-up photograph of. and. In the, in the cracks of the wood, you see a, a series of nails. And you can also make out a little bit of paint that's kind of seeped into the cracks of the wood. So what this seems to suggest is if you were to, say, go out to your deck, and you were to look at your deck, and you saw wood that was this weathered, and you saw some paint seeping into some of the cracks, and maybe some heavily, um, you know, uh, heavily uh, eroded and damaged iron nails, you would probably think it's time to replace your deck, right? So this is kind of a, a very basic observation that makes you think, OK, this, this is pretty old. We're dealing with something that's, that's not, that wasn't made um, you know, right before the hurricane hit or something like this. So next and slide. Oh. To add to that and jump in before you get to the radiocarbon date, probably used 
over a period of time. So if we go back and look at the, that slide real quick, the paint inside that weathered wood uh, tells us, of course, that the canoe was, was uh, used for a while, weathered, don't worry about going back, Molly. Weathered and then painted, don't worry about it. And the fact that we have two different types of nails from two very different time periods, which we'll talk about in detail in just a minute, tells us that it was probably in use and modified for a long period of time. But if we want to solve it conclusively, professional archaeologists usually take a small sample and send it off for radiocarbon dating. Yeah, and if we advance one more slide, yep, perfect. That's, that's what I was hoping for. Um, so uh, we have a, a few different options um, that are scientific analyses used to date wooden artifacts. And one of them, um, and Randy uh, made reference to this earlier, we take a small sample from the tree and we can send it off to a lab and we can actually measure uh, the quantities of carbon that are in the sample. And there's a lot of science behind this that we don't necessarily need to go into. I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. But what it, it ends up giving us is, is a probability of date for the artifact that's been analyzed. Now it's important to keep in mind that this date is when the tree itself was cut down. It's not necessarily when the canoe was fast, was created. It's not necessarily when the canoe was used. It's the time when the tree was cut down. And if you have a look at this graph, which is on the right side, um, you can see that we have this, this kind of three peaks, right? The three black peaks along the bottom. And each one of those represents a probability for a range of dates. And so as Randy was saying, we have a probability that the canoe dates to the middle of the 1600s. We have a probability that it dates to the late 1700s, early 1800s. And then we have a third probability that it could potentially date uh, to the early 20th century. Now these probabilities are, are split differently. So we have about a 50% chance that it dates to around the middle of the 1600s, and about a 40% chance that it dates to the late 1700s, and then an 8% chance that it dates to the early 20th century. And so this is, normally we, we like to have a clear cut, a, a much clearer picture, um, but because of the actual data that was collected, there were some issues, um, not on the collection end, but in the way scientists understand the radiocarbon curve at this point. So this is kind of how we ended up with these three different possibilities for the date. Next. So that was our first attempt at dating it with scientific analyses. The second one is what's called uh, dendrochronology. Now dendrochronology uses information we know about the tree itself and its growth. So if you have a look at this picture on the right of this screen, you can see that the tree rings are all clearly visible. Now as a tree grows, every year it adds a ring. And what dendrochronologists do is they will look at the patterns of the rings because each ring is slightly different depending on the amount of water and sunshine the tree gets during the course of the year when it grows. So what you can do is you can count up the tree rings and figure out how old the tree is if you know when it's cut down. If you don't know when it's cut down, you can count up the tree rings and try and match the shapes of the rings to a tree of a known age and then work backwards and figure out how old it was. So this is kind of how dendrochronology works, and it's very specific to the type of tree that we're using. So this is a red cedar tree, as we've already talked about, and that was identified by Professor Lee Newsom at Flagler College. And then the dendrochronology was done by a team from the University of Tennessee. They looked at the sample, they were fascinated by the sample. The sample did not yield conclusive results, but it's very exciting because this is a this is an um, unusual specimen for the lab in Tennessee, and they're going to add this to their database, and the Irma canoe could be uh, fundamental for them creating a chronology for red cedar trees that will further inform the way they understand how these trees grew in the southeast, and that can really build a lot of research in the future. So the next question people wanted to know, and the next question we wanted to know and wanted to answer, is, uh, is how was it made? And <clears throat> dovetails a little bit with when does it date to, how old is it? Because the, the manufacturer marks, the tool marks, but also the, the fasteners, the nails that are embedded in it, can tell us a little bit about how old it was. So as we pointed out, I mean, just right off the bat, right after the Facebook post and then 
Brevard County being in the news for, uh, for really a couple months. Um, we saw two things, two types of nails on the canoe that were in a little bit of contradiction with each other, at least in terms of trying to, to assign an, a date to it or an age. We have two, two types of nails, cut nails and wire nails. There's also wrought nails, which are slightly earlier, but we'll talk about cut for a little bit. And the way you can, you can differentiate these early cut or wrought nails from wire nails is cross-section. So cut or wrought nails have a square cross-section. If you held them up and looked at them straight on, they would look like a square or a rectangle. And if you look at wire nails and cross-section, they look like a circle. And you guys can see very clearly here from these really nice, almost glamour shot pictures, close-ups of the nails, <laughs> um, that, the, that we've got both cross-sections represented. And, and that tells us immediately since Rot nails were invented and then in use in uh, a little bit before 1800 and thereafter. And cut nails came into vogue, especially here in the early 1800s. Uh, and then were replaced by wire nails for sure around, the, around 1900, became very popular in the middle 20th century. We can tell that we've got both periods represented. And we can interpret that a few different ways. Maybe it was initially used in this time period when, when cut or rot nails, and I say cut or rot because the experts, I'm not one of them, uh, the experts have not agreed on whether it's cut or rot. It makes a difference in date. But these cut or rot nails, these older nails, uh, may, have been, may have been placed in the canoe when it was first used, and then over time, these later wire round cross-section nails were placed in them. Alternatively, since cut or wrought nails were invented at the time of wire nails, maybe the wire nails uh, during the 20th century sometime, people were using wire nails on this, but also used cut older nails, right? Kind of heritage nails. Um, and there's not a conclusive way to tell this, at least from the, uh, the physical evidence right here in front of us. But it indicates that, uh, that we do have two different time periods represented at least at least initially. What we also know is that it was for sure made with metal tools, and we usually associate that here in Florida with uh, Euro-Americans or, um, or you know, colonial people, not Native American construction. And like Randy alluded to, Pedro Zepeda with the Seminole tribe, he still makes canoes and looked at it and said, it's not one of our canoes. They've got a long history of canoe making. It doesn't look like one of their canoes. And uh, he also made an interesting comment about the wood choice and the knot. And he said, that just makes no sense at all, which I'll come back to in, in just a minute. But what, what we can tell from the, the tool marks on it is that it was absolutely made with metal tools. Those, those uh, you know, corners, squared off corners, were attributed to European manufacture in historic time period as early as the 1980s when people first started studying canoes. Another observation that's interesting about this canoe is that we found traces of paint. Um, and so we have some, some excellent photographs. Um, and when you go and have a chance to have a look at it in the other room, you'll see uh, there are just a, tiny little uh, patches of paint red paint in the front and the um, back compartment. And then there's a little bit of blue paint on the, um, on the starboard side towards the, the end of the boat. And you can kind of see the, the two little patches of blue paint. Uh, this is a, a, a real uh, novelty for us. We, there are very few canoes in Florida that have been found with paint still preserved. So we were very excited when we found out that there was paint. And so one of the things we did was we tried to figure out What's the paint made out of? And then we also try to figure out, okay, we see these little patches of paint. Now, is, are those patches just restricted to that area or is this a matter of preservation? In other words, were there much bigger parts of the canoe that were painted at one time, but a lot of that paint has now vanished because it's been exposed to water and air and it just kind of flaked off and disappeared over time. So we, we started this analytical process where we took um, a machine and it's shown on the next slide. Um, and we, we took measurements on the side of the canoe, looking for traces of the, these paints. And so what Julie here is doing is she's using what's called a portable X-ray fluorescence machine. And that ge generates geochemical data 
Um, and what we can do from that is figure out what, what the paint's made out of. And we can also, if we know what the paint's made out of, we can start measuring parts of the boat where we don't see any paint. And we can ask the question, OK, well, we don't see any paint there, but maybe the geochemical signature of the paint got absorbed into the wood. So even if we can't see it anymore, we can find geochemical traces of it and then kind of reconstruct what, what uh, the Irma dugout may have looked like. So our first test was on the blue paint. And you can see the blue squiggly line above my head here. And one thing that you'll see is that there's a really high uh, concentration of zinc and titanium. Now that's important because it's chronologically diagnostic. Now we know zinc oxide paints were introduced in the latter half of the 19th century. And uh, titanium-based paints are even later. So we're looking at titanium-based pa paints coming in around 1910, 1920. Now, of course, it's important to stress that the application of the paint does not necessarily coincide with the first production of the boat. As Randy's mentioned a few times, it's entirely possible that the boat went through many different life cycles. So it may have started off as, as an unpainted vessel, and then they may have added the red paint, and then they may have added the blue paint at different times. But what we do see is that the blue paint and the red paint both point to dates of the late 19th century, early 20th century, with the blue paint kind of tipping the balance towards the late 20th century, again, at least for when it was painted. And then if we go to the next slide, we were also able to take measurements in the compartments of the boat and determine that while there's only small patches of red paint preserved in the front and back compartments, we're fairly confident that, in fact, all three compartments were painted red. So this is a very uh, interesting um, way to visualize this, this vessel. Why would they paint only the compartments red and, uh, and why red? Uh, we found no geochemical evidence of blue paint anywhere else on the boat. That doesn't exclude the possibility that the blue paint was also part placed on other parts of the boat. It just may be a matter of us not being able to measure it properly. But certainly, the compartments were painted red, which is another unusual characteristic of the Irma dugout. So who saw the 3D model that was put up on, online on, on Sketchfab and probably saw it on YouTube? Did you get to play around? If you have not seen the 3D model, write this down right here, USF uh, DHHC and DHR. Um, and go to, you can probably just Google it, because this got 20,000 views. Not as many shares, I know, as your Facebook post, Randy. But, uh, but this is an excellent way for us to preserve history. And more importantly, not only, not only preserve it, because we've got this model forever, um, God forbid anything happens to the, the dugout in the next couple, couple years. But um, we also have a means to take really accurate measurements. So uh, a couple of researchers from the University of South Florida uh, came to Brevard County, and the Lathrops were nice enough to invite them into their house and garage, I think, even. Yeah, so turned into a laboratory. The laboratory in the garage. They took a very detailed scan of the entire canoe on every single side uh, and pieced it together and probably through hours of processing. Uh, and at this point, somebody makes like a do, 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 do. I'm sure that's exactly how it went on the other side of it. A very, very detailed, informative 3D model is created. And through that model, uh, we were able to look very close up at things like the manufacturer marks, the nails, the contours of the, the dugout compartments, the three compartments, um, the little notches in the side, as well as even um, flipping it over, a couple of curious little features on the exterior of the, of the dugout, which, uh, which we will talk about in just a second here. Um, <clears throat> but the, the model showed an overview of all of these features that we can essentially answer the question, what is it with? All these particular features. Molly, let's see if it's on the next slide. We have a couple of features that were immediately relevant or immediately visible in the, the 3D model illustrates it very well for those who didn't see it. There's a pointed bow, which we see in other canoes. Seminole canoes have a really classic bow like this, a cut water. Um, a knot at the bow, which is, in fact, one of the, the only ones I've seen like this. And as I said, Pedro Zapata commented that it was a very weird, uh, weird wood choice. 
A squared off stern, which we see typically in the historic period, the Appalachia Appalachicola Trader's Canoe is a great example of a canoe that's also got a squared off stern. Uh, and we've got three compartments throughout the boat, very square, deep, uh, or rectangular, deep compartments, just like those on the Wakulla River unfinished canoe um, up near Tallahassee. We have a couple of thwarts in the middle, which we see on canoes all throughout Florida's history. Uh, even at Noonan's Lake, we have some very old canoes with these thwarts, these raised parts that haven't been completely dug out, sort of hold the boat together. Uh, we even have examples of seats in other canoes, or at least things that have been interpreted as seats. Um, Wilford Neal writes about this, and this article is online, 1950s even. His canoe number six, Miccosukee dugout number six, has something that he interprets as a seat. And one of the photographs in that article uh, also has a little bit of the, the form, the shape of, of something like this. That's a seat. And then notches and grooves are also visible very clearly on this, this 3D model. And we have a couple of dugouts. The Appalachicola Trader's Canoe is one with full grooves and actually um, tunnels through the canoe. Uh, and notches seen on, on other historic vessels, such as the, the sailing canoes from South Florida, normally. But what, what's interesting about this canoe, even though we see certain features on different boats repeated, uh, with the exception really of the knot at the bow, I think, and with, with the exception of the wood type, which we've already talked about as being cedar, we see these on other canoes, but it is unique that we find them all together on one vessel. And that's really interesting. Um, and, and a lot of our canoes are like that, in that they pull together uh, features that we see elsewhere, all in one boat, and tell one unique story. People immediately uh, commented as well on the, the shape, the overall shape of the dugout, of the boat. Um, and some people first said, well, it looks a little, little narrow, right? That was one of the first comments. It looks a little bit narrow for a boat. Um, and we've, we've got examples of people standing and polling in, in dugouts. So I wouldn't worry too much about the narrowness, although it is on the, the narrow side. It falls within the, the range, the, the middle range of our widths for canoes. And people said it's also a little short. Well, it's about average. A little under if we go strictly by average, but uh, it's about average and it falls right there in the middle. People then asked uh, about whether we had seen these types of boats, these shapes of boats in this area. And this picture uh, shows right here, this was something Martha Passaro locally uh, sent to us as kind of a, I can't believe I found this. We found this in old records, uh, and this photograph was taken near Sam's house, if that rings a bell for probably a lot of people who live around here, of a woman in a canoe that looks from straight on similar in terms of bow shape and in terms of even, even width. The gunnels are a little thicker. But, uh, and we have other examples, such as the Apalachicola Trader's Canoe, um, with this kind of pointed bow, but most importantly, really squared off deep compartments. Huh? And so it falls right there in the, in the middle range. Now, after people asked, what is it, too, we took a lot of standing around and crossing our arms and looking at it sideways and questioning it. And as we were walking in today, uh, the mayor, in fact, said, hey, where'd you get that telephone pole from? And it was a joke, in fact, a joke just like that made by somebody who works in BAR Conservation and Collections as we were standing around, uh, not just looking at it, but really throwing out hypotheses and trying to figure out, trying to work through uh, some of the scenarios like Randy listed of, of what could have led to this canoe appearing on the shore last year. And he made a joke, and we didn't think about it for three months. And then, uh, and then the wood identification came back as cedar. And that little joke came back into the forefront of our minds. We thought about it a little harder. and thought, well, <clears throat> looked, into, looked into telephone poles just a little bit, utility poles more precisely. 
And cedar was, was the most commonly used wood type for telephone poles, for utility poles, during the historic period. Uh, soon replaced by pine because it was cheaper and because we were, we were cutting down a lot of cedar trees. It takes cedar trees a lot longer to grow as big as they, they have over on, uh, over on River Road. And we took that, that hypothesis to USF and asked them to, to look into it, essentially, and asked them to use the 3D model to try to see if, if some of these, uh, these jokes might have some validity to them. And there were a couple lines of evidence that, that really stood out uh, after looking at it with a research question in mind. And that's a really important thing that we want to point out here today, which is looking to the canoe for answers um, with specific questions, right? And these are the same exact questions that you asked, but with the specific question, could it have been originally manufactured from a utility pole? So after the 3D model was analyzed, do, 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 she came back with an answer, well, the width, the mean width, matches the standard set for utility poles in the early 20th century. In other words, the, the 34 centimeters, I believe it is wide, uh, the diameter is within the range of the, the poles and the standard specifications. There are a couple features on the very end of the dugout, the stern, two little points in particular that's measure that that the, the width between them matches exactly the tools used to hold logs in place as they were being uh, debarked and, and spun and turned into, turned into poles of any sort, much less utility poles. And then she matched up, or, or she measured, she took a lot of precise measurements on the, the uh, channels or the, the notches, um, which we were first looking at and scratching our head and thinking maybe they were places where rope had worn grooves into the boat or where somebody had drilled into the side of it. And those measurements match the width, the gauge of spikes uh, that are used on utility poles for, if you've ever seen early pictures of poles, with the little L's coming out, for climbing poles. And, uh, and so these lines put together uh, makes us think that maybe there's some validity in the, the joke or the offhand comment that, that it could have been originally a, a utility pole repurposed as a vessel or, or transformed into a vessel. Now, from that utility pole hypothesis, um, we started looking very closely at the, the marks on the, the dugout itself, on the outside of the log. And this is something that Randy pointed out very early and, and we were looking at really early, is that on uh, starboard side, there are over 10 nails in a row, very thin gauge wire nails. So these are 20th century nails, most probably. They're all in a row and the, the wood is weathered uh, differentially where it appears that something was attached to the exterior of the log. Now, that could have been an outrigger attached to this log, or this log could have been attached as an outrigger to something, to another type of vessel, including maybe even a sailing canoe. Um, and, and that's going to be hard to tease out. But the bottom line is it does look like this outrigger, or it does look like this dugout was used as or in conjunction with an outrigger. So maybe more precisely, the term uh, to use is, is dugout rather than canoe. It may never have been pulled itself. It may have even been sailed. It may have been the stabilization, and that's the purpose of outriggers, the stabilization for, for another vessel. <clears throat> One other line of evidence that we could look to to, to figure out if this was used as a, as a canoe or an outrigger would be the wear patterns on either side. And so as I said, on starboard side, there are uh, attachment points for an outrigger. And we would expect on that side for it to be a little bit protected, if you think about the two, the two pontoons, essentially. And on port, we would expect for the wear to be uh, a, little bit, a little bit more intense because it was exposed, right? So think about docking a boat. Um, and if you dock a boat like I dock a boat, it's a little like bumper bowling. Um, and, and the exterior of that boat 
uh, let's say it's a kayak, not a yacht, hopefully, uh, gets a little bit more beat up, right? If we look very closely, that's the pattern of wear that we have on this dugout. And on the side opposite where the attachments were, uh, we've got intensive wear. We've got intensive beating from hitting something. And on, on the side that would have been protected by the other vessel, the outrigger or the, the larger vessel that this was attached to as an outrigger, we see a lot less wear, which I think lends credit to the idea that it could have been, it could have functioned as an outrigger or a conjunction. So coming back to our idea of having pieces of the puzzle, but not all of them and not really the full picture, we, we just kind of want to really quickly summarize some of the analyses that have been run on this, uh, on this artifact. So we, we've talked about its shape and how that shape fits within the 400 plus other canoes that have been found around Florida. We've talked a bit about the tool marks and the nails. So these are signs that it was used over a period of time. It was made from metal tools. Uh, it was certainly historic or ancient, depending on how you want to use that term. Um, we ran through the scientific dating, some of the um, difficulties that we encountered as part of the scientific dating. In particular, the fact that we have three statistical possibilities, 50% chance that it dates to the 1700s, about a 35 or 40% chance that it dates to the 1800s, and then about a 10% chance that it dates to the early, 20, early 20th century. We went through the paint and we looked at the paint and we were able to figure out that all three compartments of the vessel were painted red, um, but it doesn't seem to be the case that any other parts of the vessel were painted. Uh, and we also were able to kind of use the paint as another way of estimating at least when the canoe was in use, not necessarily when it was made, but it seems to be the case that from the titanium and zinc that the canoe was probably in use as late as the uh, late 1800s and um, early 20th century. We also looked at the wood ID, um, and as Julia said, that's really critical to asking questions about um, how it was used. We know that it's uh, red cedar, and this is there aren't very many examples of red cedar canoes, uh, but it might be more commonly used for utility poles. So these are some of the pieces of the puzzle. These are some of the pieces that we're going to use to answer some of the questions that we've raised. So how old is it? How is it made? And what is it? And we're bringing this as a, as a proposal, really. We propose that a possibility is that, go ahead and uh, advance them. It was an outrigger, or used in conjunction with an outrigger, painted red, built from a utility pole in the early 20th century, at least in use in the early 20th century. And if it was these things, if it was an outrigger or used with an outrigger, if it, if it was you know, painted fully red, built from utility pole and used in the early 20th century, I think, personally, that makes it extraordinarily interesting. It makes the, the story of this, this dugout incredibly unique. Uh, to have creativity in adaptive use of something like the utility pole, um, <clears throat> and also creative painting and decoration and claiming ownership, perhaps, by, by painting it red. Um, and then, as, as we see from you know, the radiocarbon dates, plus the nails, plus the manufacture marks, plus the invention of electricity, uh, and use around here in the 19th and early 20th century, um, you know, a, a, an indication that this was in use for a long period of time and modified. And most importantly, it's, a, it's an important piece and a unique piece of Florida's past, and not only Florida's collective past, but more importantly, Brevard County's unique and local past. And we're really excited and very thankful that you guys have invited us here today to share uh, the exploration of what this could mean to the community here and take part in welcoming it home. Thank you. So, 
Yeah, it's fascinating, and that's an excellent point because if any of you keep boats in, uh, well, of course the Atlantic, but Indian River, right? Mm -hmm. Indian River, um, you get barnacles very quickly. Oh, yeah, you aspect of this, and you said the, the phrase bottom of that boat, is that the barnacles, and there were a few barnacles on this boat, are on the interior compartment. There are a few barnacles on the interior compartment. Little ones, little ones, form quickly, but, uh, but not on the hull, the exterior of the boat where you would imagine they would grow if it were, you know, placed and stored in water, which leads us to think that it, it didn't spend a long time in in water with any salinity, right? And the, the absence of the wood being waterlogged suggests that it wasn't submerged in water, in fresh water either. It was probably under some sediment, or if not, you know, exposed to, exposed to air. Question? Where would a piece of red cedar Well, uh, as Randy said, it's entirely possible that uh, red cedar was found somewhere in the vicinity of where the canoe was found. Um, he says that there is... Right where yeah. the canoe was found, there's huge, large red cedar trees right there. Magnificent. They're on one side, once on one side of the driveway, and once on the other side of the driveway. And it took two or three trips there before one was finally wet. So Bob's referring to the, the gauging holes that we see oftentimes in especially Seminole canoes, uh, where people would drill holes down into the interior of the dugout to gauge how deep the, the dugout compartment was so they wouldn't you know, dig straight through the log. And in this, this dugout, we don't see a single gauging hole or any evidence of one that's you know, been plugged or, or the very remnants of it. That's a, that's a very interesting question. So um, we have, and we do have examples that are roughly contemporary with Wendover of canoes that have been documented um, in Florida. And, and it's, it's a really fascinating corpus of material that we have um, in our state of all these different vessels that have been washed up and documented. Uh, this particular example, because of the, the scientific analyses that we've conducted on it, we can, we can say with a, a pretty good confidence that it, it can't be that old. So the, we're talking several thousand years old for Wendover. And, um, and so we have our, our probabilities for the, the dating. And that's kind of outside of, of the realm of, of what, we'd, what we would accept as uh, statistically probable. So it seems unlikely. We brought the canoe. Is that, does that count? <laughs> no, to that point, uh, Steve organized um, 
a, a couple of, of journal articles. There will be four. They will come out in the Florida Anthropologist, hopefully, if they pass peer review and everything else. And the Florida Anthropologist is a, is a journal. It's peer reviewed, but it's, it's made for uh, the public. We try to avoid jargon and in scientific terms, try to make it very accessible. You can get all of the back issues of the Florida Anthropologist online um, for free. Um, there's, no, there's no paywall or anything. You don't have to be part of the university. And those will come out, you know, hopefully in a year, maybe next year. Um, and there, there's also archived uh, talks online that we did back in March. And most importantly, there's a fantastic exhibit right down the hall which I think is actually a fantastic point to end on to make sure that if you haven't yet seen the exhibit and seen the, the canoe back in its home here in Brevard County, uh, you absolutely have to go see this wonderful exhibit that Molly Thomas and the City of Canaveral has sponsored. So. Just going to be a permanent home. I think we'll turn that question over to Molly, I think. That she's probably most suitable for that. If they'd like it to be a permanent home, then the loan can be renewed. So it's really, it's really in yes. your hands. Do you have any future plans? Yes. Um, it's going to stay here for now, but once the Cape Center is complete, it'll be moved across the street to the Cape Center, and it's going to be our crown jewel. Yes. So if there's no more questions for Steve and Julie, thank you guys so much for coming up. And right around the corner, I'm going to go out there and unlock the door. We can fit about 10 people at a time in the room. It's in the community artifacts room. So if you guys want to form a queue, we'll get everybody in. Very good presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming out. Thank you. And thanks for hosting this. I mean, this is insane. Molly has just.